Thank you, sir. Thank you. Gio, thanks so much for coming to our fireside chat at Transparency 18. I'm sorry we had to tear you away from Hilton Head, but I'm um, really glad you could be here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, I know we're just before lunch, so I'm, I'm picturing you all with pitchforks in your hands, and so we'll, tr we'll try to make it brief. Okay, so um, just, I guess we'll, we'll get into it. Um, one of the things that I really was sort of envisioning for our conversation is giving you and Thor a chance to make the case that you can be successful cold starting a new OEM. So what are you doing that other um, you know, truck manufacturing incumbents aren't doing? Yeah, but, so there's a few things on the technology side as well as the, the business side that are a little different about what Thor's doing. So I guess starting with technology, we've really focused on batteries and building batteries that are right for the job. So we took on battery development in-house and um, have built some IP around long-range, lightweight batteries that, that make a lot of sense and are, and are even low cost, which is really necessary in the commercial space where you can have you know, four or five, 600 kilowatt hours on a class eight vehicle. Um, so that's, that's on the technology side. A battery and systems focus is critical for a smaller company like us. Um, and then on the business side, Unlike some of the other folks that we've seen in this space, we are very partnership oriented. We don't have that Silicon Valley attitude of, you know, the industry is completely broken, nobody knows what they're doing, we're gonna reinvent every piece of it and take over the world. Uh, we're much more of the perspective that there are folks in the industry that have been doing a lot of things uh, really well and that things have, some things have existed the way that they have for the last 50 years for good reasons. So when it comes to uh, chassis parts, uh, we think it makes a lot more sense to buy suspensions and wheel ends from people that have been doing it well, rather than you know, put together our own research project of uh, uh, reinventing the wheel, so to speak, on every <laughs> right. single part of the vehicle. Right. Um, and then same goes for things like service and maintenance and manufacturing. So rather than needing to own every single piece of the value chain, we're more than happy to focus on the, uh, the, the large challenges that we have in just the battery and the systems and vehicle de design and development and leave things like manufacturing to people that have manufacturing facilities already. And, and that way we don't need to go raise our own billion dollars to, to build the world's millionth factory when a lot of the OEMs and, and bodybuilders and other folks have plenty of spare capacity in their factories that they'd be more than happy to offer up to a company like us. That's really interesting that you say that um, you guys are so partnership oriented. You kind of have a humility toward the industry in a way that I think one potential electric truck manufacturer that shall not be named maybe doesn't. Um, Gio, where Can't is... Can't imagine who you're talking about. <laughs> right. Um, Gio, where is Thor Trucks right now? What, what's, what are you guys working on at the moment? Yep, so we've got uh, a small batch of trucks on the road that are being used right now for demonstration. So we're in the phase right now where we're just trying to put as many miles as we can on vehicles, do some durability testing, um, show the vehicles to customers, uh, get feedback and be able to iterate quickly because at the, at the end of the day, one of the, the few things that startups have advantages over larger incumbents is agility. Um, so we can switch directions, change technology if we need to. Um, and it's, it's more difficult in hardware, admittedly, uh, than software. And that's, that's a big lesson learned for anybody out there who's working on hardware. I'm sure you uh, have felt that pain before. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the, the basis of it. I'm interested about what you said about the agility of the startup, your know, phrase is startup, and I've experienced a little bit of that firsthand. What's something that you learned or that Thor learned that surprised you guys when you were sort of um, building the EV1? Yeah, so um, I, I think the inefficiencies of larger companies are surprising in some ways. Like when you go to large tier one suppliers, you think of them as the, the leaders of their industry. It can be hard to get you know, information, answers, help from them in, in areas when it really should be easy. Uh, another big point of learning for us was on battery technology. So myself and my co-founder, Dakota, 
we, are, we come from a fleet operator background rather than, than being engineers ourselves. And so before we started the company, we spent six months tinkering and, and putting together models and um, trying to kind of assemble our dream truck in our head and, and in a model um, before we started hiring on, hiring on engineers. And it was only a few weeks ago that we made our first non-engineering hire, hire. So we're about you know, 90, 95% engineers at our company. And how, how um, big are you right now? We're about 30. Okay. Yeah, and so the, another big lesson learned was in batteries. When we first started out, before we decided to go our own way, we, uh, we tried to buy battery packs off the shelf that we could plug in. So we talked to probably 100 plus different suppliers. And what we found is that the, the great majority of packs out there that are being, even the ones that are being used in commercial applications, were designed for passenger cars and then adapted to commercial applications. And we just didn't think that was gonna work because the way that you design a passenger car battery is that you start out with the, a really small space and that becomes your defining characteristic. So the, the optimization problem is how much energy can we cram into this space and then you can worry about things like safety and cost and cooling and the other complexities involved. The beauty of the commercial industry is that we have the luxury of space. So we can start from a position of, okay, we have plenty of space, let's focus on safety. Let's focus on cost. Let's focus on light weighting. Uh, you know, different cooling strategies that people aren't going after. And that learning experience kind of, well, really forced us into building our own batteries, which is one of the better decisions that we accidentally made, to be honest. Um, so it's been a big advantage for us. We, we feel like we have some pretty strong battery technology that would be terrible in a passenger car, but is purpose-built for commercial vehicles, which is what we're trying to do. And that's another thing, another important thing to, that, I, that I like to kind of explain is that we're also not trying to build the truck that solves everybody's problems. We're, we're very focused on applications in which electric vehicle technology makes sense today. Um, so things that are relatively short range, uh, 300 miles and under is generally, generally the space that we like to play in, and, and that's assuming fully loaded at a Class 8 GVWR, so we're talking 80,000 um, pounds. Things that do lots of starts and stops, things that would benefit from being quiet, like refuse trucks, for example, um, and things that um, do spend a lot of time idling. So in drayage, especially in, in the ports around LA, Los Angeles and Long Beach, trucks can be sitting in line for two hours before picking up a... Um, a load, and then similarly, I, I was on a panel yesterday with a gentleman, Bill, from, from UPS, and he was saying that in their LA routes, out of eight hours, the driver's spending six hours in traffic idling, and two hours actually driving. Right. Um, so, so there's plenty of applications where electric technology is a home run today, and we don't try to force everyone into it. I, I met another driver yesterday who said that he can fit enough fuel on his freight liner uh, to do 2,400 miles in a single trip. He's not our customer. He's an owner-operator. He doesn't have uh, a sensible place for him to charge while on the road. So the bread and butter for the commercial electric industry in the next few years, in, in, until there's a, uh, a, a kind of broader public charging infrastructure built out, are gonna be those applications that are short range and return to home at night. And the, the thing that a lot of folks don't realize is that's actually a good majority of the Class 8 industry. So if all of you are to close your eyes and picture Class 8 trucking, you're probably thinking of a long haul trucker who goes from LA to, to New York or Charlotte. Um, but the reality is that more than half of Class 8 trucks are doing regional and vocational applications, whether it's day cabs doing a 100 mile pickup and delivery route, drayage, intermodal, uh, things like cement, where you only have a few hours before the cement cures, and so you can't go too far from home base anyways. And those are all fantastic applications for electric technology. Nice. Um, it was really cool. You, you spoke about drayage, and, and especially in Southern California, the ports of Long Beach and LA. And a few weeks ago, I got the chance to see your all's truck um, at the ACT Expo in Long Beach. And, that conference was really interesting because it was all about 
low emission or you know, zero emission vehicles. And it was almost kind of in the context of public health. Everyone was talking about you know, how bad the air is in, in you know, the Los Angeles air basin and things like that. And I, it got me thinking sort of about um, you know, the regulatory climate that enables and sort of, um, yeah, that, that enables electric trucks. So I was wondering, um, are you guys getting subsidies um, from California? To what extent do um, things like uh, you know, them like basically phasing out diesel, how does that help you? How does that inform your business model? Yeah, so if anybody in this room grew up in the Northeast, which I didn't, um, you guys probably remember snow days from school. So I grew up in Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley where the polluted air kind of gets trapped in the valley and, and has a hard time getting out. And I remember having smog days from school where you weren't allowed to go play outside for recess because of, um, because of the air quality. And so I, I kind of have a, oh, and also folks in, in places like India and China will, that, that'll sound uh, like a familiar story to them, places where you check the, wet, the, the smog, like you check the weather. Um, and so I have very much a personal vendetta in this business. It's not just, it's not just business for me. I, I don't think our kids and our grandkids should have to grow up with the kind of air quality that I did that led to things like asthma and nebulizers and, and being in the hospital all the time as a kid. Um, so from that perspective, I think it is a noble enough goal in itself to, to do this for um, air quality purposes, but it really starts from the other way around. It's, there's great economic incentives and it's a great business on its own. It just happens to be the right thing for the environment at the same time. Um, so as far as the, the grant environment in California, uh, I'm sure you guys are semi-familiar with how progressive we are in California or, or the, the California state government is. There's all kinds of subsidies available from different pools. Um, it's up to about $350,000 per vehicle in some cases um, in Class 8 tractors. Wow. And that's not one pot of money where you, you sign up and say, hey, I want my 350 grand. There are different uh, programs from the, the Energy Commission and California ARB who's been very progressive. Um, some of them are over, counter, over the counter. Some of them require you to retire older vehicles and get them off the road. Um, and then from a, that's kind of the, the carrot perspective, and then from a stick perspective, we have um, zero emissions targets that by certain days, I think it's 2030, 2035, uh, people have to start switching over to electric technology, especially in government-related places like the ports and the airports have uh, very, very aggressive targets. Um, and then another thing that is true in California that I'm not sure exists in other markets throughout the US, but we have utilities that are willing to make infrastructure ready for uh, commercial electric vehicle charging. So that if you go to your local utility and you say, hey, I want to install 30 chargers for my fleet in San Francisco, the utility will actually pay for the power upgrade up to the charger. Um, so it, it, it makes it a lot easier um, for fleets in California to adopt these programs. But if you're not in California, I wouldn't be discouraged because there are other places that have similar programs. Um, Illinois and New York have HVIP programs, hybrid voucher incentive programs, and then the diesel mitigation funds that came out of the VW diesel scandal. Um, those, some of those funds have gone toward charging and Electrify America, which is fantastic and, and a bit more focused on passenger vehicles as, as I understand it, but also most states have a chunk of money that they are currently deciding what to do with. Um, and one of the things they can do is incentivize the acquisition of um, commercial electric vehicles, which I believe Minnesota recently did, which is awesome. And, um, but even without, I, I don't want to make it sound like these, this technology only makes sense with subsidies or over you know, a 10-year TCO. Um, I think we're finding that we can be very aggressive when it comes to pricing electric vehicles and, and be in the ballpark, at least, of what a diesel vehicle costs immediately, like n now 10, 15% more expensive maybe than a diesel vehicle. And the, the TCO is only icing on the cake. And when we talk about TCO, it's not just the cost of uh, fuel. It's not only saving money by charging instead of fuel, which depends on what you're paying for fuel and what you're paying for electricity, but also the maintenance argument. Um, there's also the compliance aspect when you don't have to worry about 
your trucks getting phased out or diesel particulate filters. Uh, there's renewable energy credits. There's, there's plenty of benefits that pile on outside of just um, incentive money. Nice. Thanks for that, Gio. Um, you, sp you said that Thor is really focused on technology and offering a product that's a home run today. Um, just to wrap things up, can I ask you to go into a little bit of a speculative mood and sort of uh -oh. estimate um, you know, when will the long haul over the road truck um, be something that makes sense um, for an electric vehicle? Yeah, so I think that's going to be both a combination of improvements in energy densities and batteries as well as the build out of a charging infrastructure. The nice thing about building out charging infrastructure is that for the most part, electricity or electrical infrastructure is already there. We have a grid and transmission lines, so it's not like some of the, the other technologies like hydrogen, which I see being more of a challenge to build up. Um, but it's still going to take time to have public facing charging options throughout the country. All right, thanks, man. Um, so our 15 minutes are up, but if you have any questions for Gio, he's actually going to be at the um, What the Truck booth. We're going to be recording a little bit later, so feel free to just walk up and, um, and make some comments and ask some questions. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks a lot.